Hello, welcome to PC Jack. Today, we're going to be getting down to some overclocking on Intel 12th Gen and seeing what kind of performance we can squeeze out of both performance cores and efficiency cores. We'll be taking a look at my Core i5-12600K and seeing what effect, if any, overclocking both the P&E cores has when it comes to running Cinebench R20. Now, I haven't had much of a chance to actually do any tweaking on my 12600K, but I'm really excited today to finally get into it and see exactly what sort of performance we can get out of it in various configurations. And maybe, seeing some of the steps that I take to overclock my CPU will help you if you're looking to do the same thing yourself as well. For today's testing, we'll be using the MSI MAG-Z690 Tomhawk DDR4 motherboard. I recently published a full breakdown of this motherboard, including its VRM and power delivery design, so make sure to check that out if you haven't yet. But by all means, this should be a great board for today's overclocking session. Cooling our CPU, we have the Noctua NHD15 Chromax Black, which is pretty much the best of the best when it comes to any sort of air cooling for CPUs. Additionally, this system is paired with 2x8GB of Crucial Ballistics memory running at 3600 speed CL16, but Cinebench isn't actually that memory intensive, but I just thought I'd point that out just in case. The idea behind today's video is to actually validate the performance of my 12600K, but just so you are aware, when you are overclocking, you may see better results yourself, or you could see worse results. It is going to vary from CPU to CPU, but you should bear that in mind as we go through today's video anyway. So for now, let's get into some baseline testing and see what kind of stock performance we're getting out of the box when it comes to our 12600K in Cinebench R20. So what I've done, I've just been through Cinebench R20 and done both the multi-core and single-core test runs, and so far we've got 6,642 points for our multi-core test, and for our single-core test then we've got 726 points. So now that we've done that and we've got an idea of what sort of performance we're getting without tweaking anything, we can sort of see uh, the actual improvement that we'll see when we do some overclocking. Now, I was keeping an eye on our CPU via Hardware Info 64, and I saw that under, under multi-core, we were seeing about 4.5 gigahertz across all the P cores, and then it was about 3.4 gigahertz on the E cores. So now that we've got an idea of whereabouts our performance is already, and we're already pulling about 116 watts. We are probably going to pull a lot more than that once we're finished overclocking today, but at least we have an idea of what we can compare to once we finish today. So I'm going to jump into the BIOS and dial in a moderate overclock and see if there's any improvement just from that. Okay, so we're in the BIOS now and basically I've just dialed in a very quick overclock and I haven't really done too much to change the original settings. But basically all I've done is I've changed our multiplier to 46 so that we can get 4.6 gigahertz across all our P cores and I've left our E cores at stock for the moment. I'm thinking we'll go for the P cores and get them where we want them to be and then we'll look at the E cores. But the aim for today is like I said around 5 gigahertz on the P cores and around 3.9 to 4 gigahertz on the E cores but we'll see how lucky we get. And the only thing I've changed to actually keep that clock speed is I've just gone to override mode and changed our voltage to 1.25 volts. We should be fine with this, but we will see if we have to lower this or increase it later on. And then for our load line calibration, I've been pretty modest and just gone for mode 5 for now. I don't really need to go too high on that, but mode 1 might be a bit too excessive for this. So we'll try mode 5, and if we need to work our way up to maybe to mode 4 or 3, we'll see how we do. So, now that we've got our first overclock dialed in, we'll just get back into the desktop and go back to Cinebench R20 and see if we're stable, and then move on from there. So, after just dialing in 4.6GHz on our P cores, we've seen a little bit of a boost to performance with uh, 6873 on our multi-core and 692 on single core. So, not a massive jump, but still a bit of an improvement already. So what I am going to try and do now is just dial in the best possible overclock I can for just the P cores, and then I will catch up with you. Okay, so taking a brief respite, I think I've reached my final overclock for my P cores. I've managed to push 5 GHz, and now, as you can see, we're getting 7,315 points on multi-core and 747 points on single-core. And considering we started off at 6,642 for multi-core and 626 for single-core, that's quite a decent jump up, to be fair, with only touching our P cores. Now, we did try and push for 5.1 GHz, but I did get a blue screen of death and then a complete hard freeze, and the system would not turn back on whatsoever, and my CPU debug LED was just stuck on, so I did have to clear the CMOS and then bring that back down to 5 GHz in the BIOS. And so I've tested that a few times, and it's actually been working out okay on there now. So... Yeah, I'm quite happy with how we're looking for the P cores. We are still on a decent voltage at the moment with 1.25, and that's using LLC mode 4 from 5, and that seems to be working out just fine for me. So I'm thinking we're going to move on to our E cores now, and we're going to see if we can push for at least 3.9 to 4 gigahertz on those, and we'll see if that gives us any improvement of what we got now. Okay, so we're back in the BIOS, and as you can see, we've got our 
50 for the multiplier for the PCOR ratio. And now I've gone into our ECOR ratio and changed this to 38. So we're going to start with a quite modest 3.8 gigahertz. And we'll see if that is working with the current settings we already have from our 5 gigahertz at 1.25 volts. And hopefully it should manage this as well. So fingers crossed. We'll get back into the desktop and we'll test this out first. Okay, so we've just stability checked our 3.8 gigahertz on the E cores, and it seems to be stable at the moment, which is totally fine. And I've been through the multi-core and single core test runs, and there's not really a drastic difference so far. But I just wanted to ensure we did have stability with just setting it at that 3.8 gigahertz. So, so all I'm gonna do now is go for gold and try and go for the speed that I wanted to set. So we're gonna go for five gigahertz on our P cores, and then at least four gigahertz on our E cores, and hopefully, we should see some sort of improvement with the addition of the E cores being boosted as well. So, after all of today's testing, I've collated all of our scores from Cinebench R20 in order for us to better compare and see exactly what differences we've seen with the various configurations that we've run in today's testing. Starting with our P core only overclocked to 5 GHz, we can see that we've increased our score from 6,642 on multi core and 626 on single core at stock up to 7,315 on multi-core and 747 on single-core. This shows a performance improvement of around 10% on multi-core and around 19% on single-core. So overall, a fairly significant increase on multi-core, but our single-core has jumped fairly well due to boosting past our average all-core boost at stock around 4.8 GHz. But what about the increase when overclocking our E-cores too? Taking a look at our P cores at 5 GHz with an overclock of 4 GHz on all the E cores, saw a boost of just under 2% for our multi-core score compared to P core only overclocking, and an increase of less than 1%, which is not exactly a huge difference. But this could still be worth doing to creep out as much performance as possible, as it still marks an increase of up to 12% on multi core compared to stock. Lastly, I was interested to see what actual benefit our E cores were to our CPU when it came to our Cinebench scores, so I decided to actually disable them entirely and run just our P cores at 5 GHz. As you can see, this did cause a significant decrease to our multi-core score with a decrease of around 20% compared to our fully overclocked P&E cores or 10% compared to stock. However, interestingly, our single core remained largely unaffected which goes to show how little impact the E-cores will have over single thread applications such as gaming, which has some really interesting implications for those looking to boost their single core as much as possible. But this does seem to be coming at the cost of stability for some users as there are reports of disabled e-cores causing issues for some, so I would definitely exercise caution when it comes to running this sort of configuration, but I will have to do some further investigating to find out more. Overall, I'm pretty pleased with today's results, and I'm really happy that we managed to reach our target speed of 5GHz on P-cores and 4GHz on our E-cores. This is a really interesting architecture, and I can never turn down the opportunity to get my hands dirty and do some CPU tweaking. And most importantly, hopefully this video will help you with overclocking your 12th gen CPU and also ensure you know the benefits and the drawbacks of running any of these kind of configurations. So, that's it for today's video. If you enjoyed it, then please feel free to like and subscribe for more videos on the way soon. Also, make sure to leave a comment if you're interested in overclocking your 12th gen CPU. And if you have, let us know your results down below. If you're after more PC Jack content though, then make sure to check out my Twitch channel where I live stream every Monday and Thursday. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at PCJack94. If you'd like to talk more with myself and other like-minded hardware enthusiasts, then make sure to check out the PC Jack Discord. If you'd like to support the channel even further though, then make sure to check out the PC Jack Patreon where you can claim exclusive benefits while helping to fund everything I do on the channel for you guys. You'll find links to all those in the video description. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.